is to start being around other Christians who it seems like would be, you know, have been maybe Christians for years, maybe for decades. It seems like would be uh, helpful in, you know, helping them mature and grow and, and, and get stronger. But then it seemed that those those Christians who've been there for so long, so many of them just seem so uh, empty. They don't seem to give it. It's the very ones who would, who would be bringing them up and maturing them and growing their faith. That they're, it's not there. Maybe, maybe you're a young Christian. Maybe you feel that. Maybe you feel it's like, man, where, where, are, the, where are the people that are, that are helping me to, to grow and that strengthen? It's just like there's this, this strange disconnect, almost, almost spiritual cluelessness in so many ways in, in those who have been believers for, for many years. I remember so well as a, a young adult uh, having that whole young adult disillusionment kind of thing where I'll just look around all these church people and think, and it just seems like they're, they're just spiritually numb. It's just kind of in this whole just middle class lifestyle, but not, no spiritual passion, no spiritual power. You know, what's wrong with these people, you know? Of course, then I got married and got a house and had kids and started realizing how easy, easy that happens. What is it? What, what is it that, that causes it? What is it about our kind of modern American Christianity that tends to just pull us into sort of just a going through the motions, very spiritually shallow kind of existence? Where's, where's that? I mean, think about it. Who do you know who just knows God? I mean, knows God, not just knows about God and can teach a lesson about God, but, but who just clearly walks with God? Who, when you're around them, there there is a there is a depth to conversation with them. There is a there is a a, a, a peace and a joy that comes from them. A joy that in bad times and in good times, a peace that just like where, where you know where does that come from? A love for people, a compassion for people. Who, who do you know who just knows God? Not that they're perfect. Not that they're perfect in any stretch that really knows God, is obviously walking with God. Why does it seem that such people seem so few and, and far between? And there's a lot of things that we could point at for that. But in our, our modern American culture, I think there is, is, is one thing that uh, at least is one major reason why spiritual shallowness is, is the rule rather than spiritual depth. And I could sum it up this way. Noise. Just noise. Yeah, uh, audible noise, but also visual noise, activity noise, any, any kind of activity, any kind of thing where we're just, our minds are being fed and that keep us from being alone with our thoughts. We don't really have to be alone with our thoughts, do we? I mean, we carry the internet in our pockets. I mean, we, we have access. There is always something to listen to, always something to see, always something to read. There is there's always, always something. And, of course, it's, this didn't just come along with Facebook and Netflix. I mean, this has been, a, been an issue for a long time. I, I was reading a book that was written in the 70s. Uh, about spiritual disciplines, and, and he started talking about how, how you know, we keep our minds and everything just occupied all the time, and we, we don't, we don't uh, get away, we don't be silent. And he, he was talking about, you know, we have newspapers and magazines and TV and radio, you know, all this kind of stuff that we fill our minds with. And so, yeah, the media has changed. The media has changed, but, the, but the, this has been around for a long time. We've been running away from our thoughts for a long time. And it's not just our thoughts that we're running away from, but we're running away from God and his thoughts. Old Testament tells a story about Elijah, the prophet. Elijah was this, this powerful prophet. He was doing incredible things in the world. He was in, in Israel. He was, he was really causing a stir, really making things happen. 
But after a while, he just started looking around. He's like, nothing's changing. I'm doing all these things, this amazing things. God's working through me. Nothing's changing. The people aren't turning to God. Nothing's happening. And he became discouraged and disillusioned and, and, and angry. And somebody wanted to kill him. And so he started running for his life. And after a while, though, he quit running from something. And you realize he's searching for something. Because he, he got a safe distance away from the person who was trying to kill him, but he just kept going. He just kept going. And for 40 days through the desert, Elijah walked on foot, walked on foot, all the way to this mountain, Mount Sinai. See, Elijah, in this 40-day trek, kind of retraced the route of the Israelites after they left Egypt and went to Mount Sinai. And Elijah was searching for something. He wanted a sign from God. He wanted a message from God. He wanted something because nothing, nothing was working. And he got there to the mountain, waiting on God. And this wind came. This, this wind, that is powerful wind, a wind like the wind that parted the waters of the Red Sea for the Israelites to cross. But God wasn't in the wind. And then an earthquake came. This big earthquake, just, just like the earthquake that shook that very same mountain hundreds of years earlier when the Israelites were gathered at the mountain to hear from God and to get His laws. But God wasn't in the earthquake. And then a fire came. A fire like, like the fire that led the Israelites through the wilderness in the, in the nighttime that indicated the presence of God. God wasn't in the fire. And then there came this little gentle breeze. This soft whisper of a voice. And God was there. And God spoke to Elijah. And God reminded Elijah of who he was. And God helped Elijah know who he was and what he wanted him to do. You see, we want God to appear to us. We want God to come to us in the noise, in the noise of life. We want it to be dramatic. We want it to be big. And yet what God usually does is that he comes in quietness and he speaks in quietness. Psalm 46, God says through the, through the psalmist, he says, be still, be still and know that I am God. And as you read the Bible, all the, the men and women of faith, they did just that. They would get alone they would get quiet, and they would be with God. The man who seemed to do it the most is the man we would think would need it the least. And that was Jesus. Uh, just one of the times this is referenced is in Luke 5, where it says the news about Jesus spread all the more so that the crowds of people came to hear him and be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. I wonder, he's the son of God. Why does he need to do that? I mean, of all, all of it, you know, he's the son. Why would he need to? What we forget is that Jesus was truly human. And as a human, he had human needs. And a basic, essential need of every human being is to get quiet, be alone, and to spend time with God. I mentioned before I've been reading this, this, uh, this book. It's really a modern classic. It's called The Celebration of Discipline by uh, uh, Richard Foster. And then he, he discusses some of the ways that, that God uses to help his children grow, some of which we're, we're talking about in this series. But he, what surprised me about the book most was how he started it. Because when he started talking about these spiritual disciplines, these things to put in our lives that help us grow, both by ourselves and with others, he started with one that 
It just seemed really odd to me. He didn't start with prayer and Bible study and, and all those, uh, giving and all those things like we've studied in the last, last three weeks. He started with meditation. Meditation? We don't even think of that being a Christian discipline. That's something, you know, you know, the, you know doing the Eastern you know, religions or something. No, what was that about? But after a while, it really became clear why, that, why he started there. Because, because meditation, Christian meditation, is simply about learning to be alone, be quiet, be still, and, and focus on God. Meditation is learning to listen to that quiet whisper of a voice, that whisper of God. Many of us are, are not very, very good, not very motivated in, in prayer and Bible study, in, in large part simply because we haven't learned how to be quiet. We haven't learned how to be still. We haven't come to know the joy that comes from being quiet in God's presence. We don't learn how to meditate. We don't, we don't learn how to spend time in, in silence and solitude by hearing a lesson on it. That's not the way we learn it. This right here is noise, okay? Hopefully it's helpful noise. Hopefully it's good, but, but, but it's noise. It's, 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 more, it's more input. We, we learn to spend time in silence and solitude by doing it, by getting alone, by being quiet for a time, day by day. And uh, this morning, I, I'm going to uh, try to lead us in something that I know is very uh, difficult in this sort of setting. Um, we are not alone here. We've got lots of people around us. And it's not quiet, and it's not going to be quiet. But we're going to do our best. I'm going to give us a chance to, to get a, just a little taste of being quiet of being still in God's presence, of, of learning to, to listen to his voice as, as he speaks to us in, in that, that quiet whisper that so many times we simply don't hear because of, of the noise in our life. And uh, this is, if you're, if you're here for the, with us for the first time, this is not what we normally do, okay? Don't think we're, we're really weird and, you know, we're, uh, we're, we're not, and, and if you're kind of weirded out by this, just try it. Just try it. You're not going to turn into the Dalai Lama or anything like that. Uh, it, it just, just, uh, just allow that, allow the time to, to happen. Uh, I just encourage you to. Um, one, one method of, of meditation is what we might call a scripture meditation. Let's just imagine that uh, one morning or one night that, that you're just, you're, you're reading in your Bible, you're reading the book of Luke, and you come to chapter 10, where, uh, where it's the little story about, about Jesus being at Mary and Martha's house. We'll, we'll, we'll read it right here. Uh, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village uh, where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now you're, you're reading this, and, and that, that line, Mary has chosen what is better, it just kind of, it kind of sticks out to you. So uh, you, you close your Bible, and you ask, what, what is better? What, what is the better? A am I choosing what is better? And you decide just to, to spend a little time just, just meditating, just in, in quietness, thinking about that scripture. So I, I want to ask you to, to just close your eyes. Close your eyes and, and, and put your feet, feet on the flat on the floor if you can, and not crossed if you can. Um, and uh, put, put your hands down, down on your lap and just, just close your eyes. And we're just gonna, we're just gonna breathe slowly for a, for a few seconds. I just want you to breathe in really, really slowly. 
hold it for, for a few seconds and breathe out. I just want you to, to imagine, place yourself in the story for a moment. Imagine yourself in that little house in ancient Israel. Martha's busy cooking in the kitchen, running here and there, picking up things, straightening things up for the, the evening meal. And every time she goes by, Mary and Jesus, and Jesus talking to Mary, and Mary just sitting there listening, Martha just gets more and more frustrated. After a while, that frustration becomes evident and she's huffing and puffing, but neither Jesus nor Mary really respond to it. And finally, she just, she just bursts out, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all this work by myself? Tell her to help me. And Jesus said, Martha, you're worried about so many things, but really only one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen what is better. And now you ask yourself and God, what person am I most like in this story? Am I, am I more like Mary? Am I more like Martha? Am I choosing what is better? And so you settle in on this simple prayer. Father, I want what is better. I want what is better. And with that simple prayer, you sit in silence. And every once in a while, you pray again, Father, I want what is better. And when your mind wanders as it, as it will, you just gently bring it back with that prayer, Father, I want what is better. And we'll spend just a few moments, a few minutes in silence and just dwell on that prayer. Um, and we're just going to do something that's often called uh, palms down, palms up. And if you don't already, go ahead and, and lay, your, lay your hands, palms down on your on your legs, one on each leg. And the palms being down, it's just a, a symbol of you just releasing to God your concerns, laying your worries down before God, the concerns of your life. And you, might, you might say, Lord, I surrender to you my worries about my job. Or God, I release to you my fears about my children, about my marriage. Or God, I, I hand over to you, I, I release, I lay down the sickness of my loved one. I release them to your care. <clears throat> 